a little bit, but let's look tonight at this idea of the prosperity gospel. And I want us to start off right up here at the top on page 85. Does everybody have your notes? Have your pen warmed up? You're going to have to fill in a little bit here. Um, and we're going to spend the next few weeks on this um, because it is so pervasive and it's a, a rather large problem that we want to deal with. But notice this by Kenneth Hagin and circle the name Kenneth Hagin there. I want you to see that this is, um, and there's, there's either quotes that either come from scripture or there's quotes that come from individuals that we're going to be looking at tonight a little bit and say, what is the prosperity gospel? Well, we get an idea of it from this quote. Jesus, however, came to redeem us from Satan's power and dominion over us. Now, do we agree with that? Yes, I hope so. Jesus came to redeem us from Satan's power and dominion over us. We are to reign as kings in this life. Do we agree with that? No. That means that we have dominion over our lives. We are to dominate, not be dominated. Circumstances are not to dominate you. Poverty is not to rule and reign over you. You are to rule and reign over poverty. Disease and sickness are not to rule and reign over you. You are to rule and reign over sickness. We are to reign as kings in life by Christ Jesus in whom we have our redemption. Now, in this, you begin to see how we've seen in other areas that truth gets wound in, truth gets woven in, with false ideas. And when those false ideas get woven into the truth and the, the, the same, the weave begins to occur, we begin to see that it corrupts the true message of the gospel. And we begin to overlook and see things that are not true message of the gospel. Over the next few weeks, there's some common phrases that we'll hear. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell me what are some of the common phrases if you were to be around prosperity gospel, if you were to be reading books or watching, of course, we know that a lot of prosperity gospel comes from television, or it can come from local churches, both, but prosperity gospel tends to do well on television. It's a popular message, very popular message. What are some of the phrases that you might hear? And I'll give you one of the, one of the, name, one of the main ones right now. Name it and... Amen. Claim it. Name it, name it. You name, your, you name your blessing or you name your issue and you claim it by faith. You name it and you claim it. What else? Are there some other key words or phrases? Yeah. You got this one guy, you'll see him on the weekends early in the morning on Channel 7. Give us your money. Your, your seed. Okay, so sowing seed. We, we, we want you to give money to sow seeds of faith and or this is seed, this is seed giving because you're going to get it back. Now, that can come from Malachi chapter 3. We talk about that. Um, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows generously will reap very generously. But we see a, a very, very clear scriptural promise made, but it start to be turned in the adaption. But you're, you're right. Sowing seed. Sow, sowing to a blessing. Okay, what else? Okay, so for perhaps a word from the Lord so we, we can start to mix in some Pentecostalism with prosperity gospel. They often go together. But um, yeah, so a, a word for the Lord in that and uh, a word of prophecy along these lines. Okay, that's, that can be mixed in. How about this one? We hear, a lot, we hear them talk about your miracle today. You're going to get this miracle. You want this miracle. You can claim your miracle. And that's kind of the name it, claim it type thing. But you, you know, people want a miracle today. We, this, you're going to get your miracle today. Um, how about this one? A lot of talk about your destiny. Your destiny. Claiming your destiny. Seizing your destiny. Going after your destiny. And it has a, a lot to do with, um, you know, what are you destined for? That you're destined for greater things. And there's a, there's a lot of talk about that. There's, there's a lot of other phrases that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks that we start to see keep rising up in prosperity gospel. But tonight we're going to see um, kind of who is it affecting and what is it that they believe? And then in the coming weeks, we'll look at that even a little bit more in a more in-depth way. And then we'll look at what do we do about it and how do we make sure that we understand it um, very well. First of all, so fill this in a little bit. It's a theology. Prosperity gospel is a theology that asserts God's aim. This is what they say, that it's God's aim to make believers healthy and what? And wealthy, underline it, in this life. That God is going to make you healthy and wealthy 
in this life, that that is the idea. Um, the idea is that we are to enjoy the excesses of God's grace and his blessings. And we are to live like king's kids. If he is the king of the universe and we are called his children, then we should be enjoying the bounty of the king's blessings in this moment, in this time. Now, what we would say is, is that if you were to go to Latin America and go to capital cities or large city centers where large Protestant churches are, either both in Catholicism, it's, it's woven its way into Catholicism some, but it's certainly in Protestant churches, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Central America, prosperity gospel is absolutely pervasive. It is everywhere. It is, it is very, very rampant. My my daughter married a, a very, very sharp young man from Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. And um, their church um, that is in, their, in the city, is about they have to drive about an hour to their church. They said that there are so few churches that preach a non-prosperity gospel in Mexico City. It is unbelievable. You can go to massive mega churches that teach prosperity gospel nearly in every, what, how do you say it? The, uh, the uh, Cartiers or the, uh, the neighborhoods in Mexico City, how would you say that? Barrios. Bar the Barrios? Barrio. Sorry. Barrios. <laughs> barrios. In the different barrios. I thought that they had a different way for that. Abuela, not abuela, uh, uh, something like that. A little bit different. But anyways, they, you can go to massive churches that are all over the place, but it's prosperity gospel. How about this one? What about sub-Saharan Africa? 99% of Christians in Nigeria would say that they believe that God wants them to be healthy and wealthy in this life. Finding Nigerian Christians that are not steeped in prosperity gospel is very difficult to do. Prosperity gospel is very, very strong in Nigeria, and not only in Nigeria, but all over um, sub-Saharan Africa. And not only, what do I mean by sub-Saharan? South of the Sahara Desert. So you go north of the Sahara Desert. That's where Marcy and I used to live. So Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. That's northern Africa. Northern Africa, of course, is what dominated by what religion? Muslim. But there have been some movements of Christianity there. In fact, God did some great things in the 90s in even Algeria and Tunisia. Thousands and thousands of people became Christians. I have told a few of you the story, or those of you who were here a few years ago, it's been a while since I've told this, but we would make, we, we were working with believers from North Africa, and we were making a film that would show other North Africans what a house church would look like, because they don't have churches that they can meet in, they have to meet in homes. And so we would go through a house church meeting. We would go through everything from welcoming people in and um, talking and sharing a little bit, having something to eat together, and then putting the kids in a, in a mode kind of there around the living room where they can be busy doing something a little bit and listening, and the adults entering into a time of singing, a time of prayer, a time of scripture reading, and a message. So we would walk through that in the video to show them what we were filming this on Malta. We couldn't film it in Algeria. I had to bring a team out of, out of Algeria to Malta, the little island in the Mediterranean, with a video crew. And we were making this thing that was going to be broadcast on the satellites. And while we were there for the week filming, um, in fact, two programs, one of testimonies and another one of house churches, um, the team that was doing the filming from Algeria, Christian guys, they came to me and they said, it was after dinner, I went up and they were hanging out in their room that night and they said, Andrew, Andrew, I have to talk to you. And we don't know how to describe this, but they had been watching satellite programming. They had been watching the charismatic television shows and they began to say, they asked two questions. The first question they said is, um, and he had it all set up, Adel was there and he had some guys standing there and he said, what does this mean? And he said, he went, and the guys fell down. And they said, why don't we have this? And I said, you got something better than that. You have the true gospel. And as they said, well, you know, we see these, we see these glorious sets of, of homes. And we see the beautiful cars. And we see the other things. Why, why doesn't God give us these things like they give, God gives you in America? 
so I was sitting there having this discussion that we're going to have tonight with guys that were in circumstances that were under great persecution. <coughs> guys who had lost brothers and sisters being killed by Islamic fundamentalists. Guys who had been beaten because they had become Christians and were baptized. Um, the, the rule of thumb is when one of my friends would finally become a Christian and be baptized, he would basically say goodbye to his family, maybe forever, but almost certainly for two or three years until after they cooled down enough that they wouldn't kill him when he came home. Literally true. It would take them time to get used to the idea that Fadila or Mofida or one of these other ladies or guys that had become a Christian. And so we're talking about a lot, a lot of confusion about why they would not experience this. And so tonight, I want us to look and see that this is affecting folks everywhere. Marcy and I also, we went to Asia, we went to Korea, we went to South Korea. And we were there with Tom Elif, we were there for a crusade. Um, I was preaching to young people and Dr. Elif was preaching to the seniors and so forth. And while we were there, I remember that we went to the largest church in the world. Um, it was um, on Yoido Island, and um, it had a sanctuary that seated 20,000 people, and they had about eight or nine services every weekend, and it seated 20,000 people. It was an amazing, amazing place. Um, but some of the passages that we're going to see tonight that are prosperity passages were in gold lettering all over the walls in the church. It was a church clearly based upon the idea that God wants you to be healthy and he wants you to be wealthy in this life. And so we want to look and we want to see what this is. Fill this in a little bit. Global Christianity today is explicitly characterized by the prosperity gospel. This is becoming more and more and more popularity and associated with Christianity. Approximately half of self-proclaimed Christians in the United States believe that God gives material wealth to those who have enough faith. So if you have enough faith, then God will give you material wealth, and he wants you to have that. 96% of self-proclaimed Christians in Nigeria would, would agree with that. Um, I had said 98 a minute ago. Uh, 96 is the, is the proper number that is here. 82% um, of self-proclaimed Christians in India, so this is a very pervasive gospel in India. 71% of Christians in Guatemala, um, and you can, you can look up where those stats came from. But here's the idea. It is subtly infused by the prosperity gospel. This is infused. It's just being woven in to the idea of the claims of the gospel. So what does prosperity gospel teach? Um, there's, there's several things, and I've tried to make them bold here so that you can see them and they'll stand out. Bottom of page 85, a distort, first of all, prosperity gospel teaches a distorted view of God and right out there to the side and the Trinity. So it's a distorted view of God and the idea of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit are not distinct persons, but rather manifestations of God. So God is sometimes manifested as Father, sometimes manifested as Spirit, sometimes manifested as the Son. Again, you could write out the side modalism. That he's in different modes at different times. And that's, that's the idea. T.D. Jakes says this, a popular prosperity teacher in, te in uh, Texas. There is one God, creator of all things, infinitely perfect and eternally existing in three, he says it, manifestations, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that's not what the gospel teaches. The Bible teaches that God is truly three distinct persons making one. So it's very often that you see in any divergent gospel that the Trinity is, is misunderstood and that the Trinity is perverted. So just watch for that. Um, the Catholic Church perverts it. Um, the, the, certainly Mormonism does, and certainly Jehovah's Witnesses do. do, do. Um, look at the next part here. A distorted view, not only of God, but is a distorted view of man. Man has spiritual power to manipulate the physical realm. So look at these ideas. Not just power. We do have some power to do that. You have the ability to work. Work is power. But here is the idea that you have a spiritual power to manipulate the realm. 
Look what Joel Osteen says um, in, this, in this paragraph. Maybe Alzheimer's disease runs in your family genes, but don't succumb to it. Instead, say every day, my mind is alert. I have clarity of thought. I have a good memory. Every cell in my body is increasing and getting healthier. If you rise up in your authority, you can be the one to put a stop to the negative things in your family life. It's just amazing. Start boldly declaring, God is restoring health unto me. I am getting better every day in every way. So the idea here is that you can simply chant away and whip yourself into a faith, if you believe well enough, you cannot have Alzheimer's disease. Now, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm not sure that Henry Blackaby doesn't have really strong faith. I think Henry Blackaby is a pretty faithful guy with a pretty strong faith. And if Henry Blackaby is dealing with Alzheimer's disease, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's because he didn't have enough faith. But that's the idea that is here. The world revol revolves around man's wants. The world revolves around men. Look what Kenneth Copeland says. You don't have a God in you. You are one. Kenneth Copeland. You see, this is, when you see statements like that, you start to see, well, this is the essence of sin. It's distorting who God is, and it's distorting who you are, and it's, it's actually coming to make yourself into the place of God. The spiritual place of God. Others exist to serve you. Look at the statement by Joel Osteen. I've come to expect to be treated differently. I've learned to expect people to want to help me. My attitude is this. I'm a child of the Most High God. My Father created the whole universe. He has crowned me with favor. Therefore, I can expect preferential treatment. I can expect people to go out of their way to want to help me. Wow. We're going to see a bunch of passages here tonight before we finish, and especially in the next few weeks, but that, that start to show us that the Apostle Paul might have gotten up and punch, punched Joel Osteen in the nose over that. Because the Apostle Paul was run from city to city with people chasing him with stones and whips. You see, not only the distorted view of God and of man, but also a distorted focus circle the word focus, a distorted focus on health and wealth, the promises of financial success through faith, um, that, that, that you're going to be a financial success through faith. Paula White would say this, God is not magnified when you are broke, busted, and disgusted. Now that may rhyme, and that may sound like a powerful statement, but that is antithetical to Scripture. We know that God often does work through poverty and people who are poor. And God does often work through people who are completely without any means in this life. In fact, he does some of the greatest things that he does through that. And just because you are those things doesn't mean that you're disgusted. In fact, it may be one of the greatest maturities of faith is for those who are in poverty, who are looking to the Lord and have found to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I have truly found to be content. I've come to be content in wherever I find myself. Some of the godliest people I know, some of the people with the greatest faith I know, are people who really have very, very, very little in this earthly life. Paul White is considered one of... Donald Trump's main uh, spiritual advisors, by the way. Promises of physical health through faith. So here's, here's a commonly one of the statements that is there. Promises of physical health. So not only financial health, but physical health through faith. And here we see again a statement by Kenneth Hagin. I believe that it is the plan of God our Father that no believer should ever be sick. It is not, I state boldly, it is not the will of God, 
my father, that we should suffer with cancer or other dreaded diseases which bring pain and anguish. No, it is God's will that we be healed. And they will come and they will misquote 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. They will use that passage immediately, very often, and say it's by his wounds we are healed. God does not want you to be sick. You, at this moment, can experience that. So there is an expectation of health in this. Also, notice the next one is here. There is not only a distortion of God, of man, of health and wealth, but also a distorted understanding of salvation. Um, very often we see this, these two statements. Does Jesus save us from sin and damnation in eternity, or does Jesus save us from sickness and poverty on earth? Now think about that. The first one there is, does Jesus save us from sin and damnation in eternity? Look at the next one. Or does Jesus save us from sickness and poverty on earth? Which one or both of these is true? Okay, so we would, we would say that, that it is God who comes and saves us from sin and damnation in eternity. That for certainly is the gospel. But which one does the prosperity gospel center on? Do they talk most about sin and damnation in eternity, or do they tend to talk more about God coming and saving you from sickness and poverty on earth? You see, there are many, many prosperity gospel teachers that will never bring up sin. They won't talk about sin. They choose to simply be very positive. I don't want to speak to the things that are negative. You know, that's for God to decide. And very often they'll say, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. If they say, well, do you, what do you think about homosexuality? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about these various things? And they'll say, I don't know. I don't know. The, the really smooth ones will say, I don't know. They don't want to make any, they don't want to pass any judgment about anything on sin. But they will be very quick to say, I know that it is God's will for you to be happy. And I know it is God's will for you to have all the things that you need. In fact, it is God's will for you to find your destiny, for you to have your best life now. You've heard that one. So here we see it. Um, what, we, what we start to see, though, is a very different view when you start to read the Scripture than that emphasis. So circle the one that's on the bottom, or does Jesus save us from sickness and poverty now? That is the emphasis of prosperity gospel theology. Um, the sickness and the poverty right now. Um, look at the next one that is here. They often have a distorted interpretation of scripture. So they take a scripture and they distort it. And the first big part here is where you see this. The prosperity gospel rips texts from their contexts. So what, one of the things that we talk a lot about here in the life of our church is if you want to know what the meaning of a passage is, you have to understand the passage around the passage. You have to understand the context. Otherwise, you will misunderstand many, many passages in the Bible. And so notice here with me, um, in, John, in 3 John chapter 2, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Should we pray for one another prayers like this? Absolutely. You see this. This is a very proper prayer. Hey, listen, if you're praying for me, I, I do ask that you would pray that all would go well with my life. I'm praying that, that your life would be blessed by God's grace and his help and his encouragement. And I'm, I'm not praying for you to have hardship. I'm not, I'm not praying for those. I'm praying that you would, you would have faith and faithfulness through hardship. But I'm praying that God would definitely bring health. I, 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 I would ask for that. But I also have to have a view that sees God as ruling and reigning over all of this, that even in the difficulties and even in the hardships and even in the poverty and even in the stresses that God is at work. So one of the things that we would say is, is does prayer guarantee good health? We would ask, does prayer guarantee good health? This is one of the things that, that we, can, we, we can honestly ask in this as they 
take scriptures and they would turn them. Notice Mark chapter 10, verse 29, under, underneath that. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now notice this. Jesus is not looking at all of the disciples and saying, if you come to me and follow me, you're going to have a nice big house in Jerusalem. You're going to have a beach condo over on Caesarea. And you're going to have a weekend getaway house up in the mountains of Galilee. Jesus never says that. In fact, Jesus looks at them and he says, you're going to come and you're going to have persecutions. And if they came after me, what are they going to do about you? You're going to suffer hardships. Here, we see that God is saying that there's such a bigger picture that is here. When he's speaking to this, he is saying to Fadila and Majid and Ramadan and my other friends in North Africa, he's saying, yes, you may become a Christian. You may become part of my family and your own earthly family. They may reject you. They may even beat you. And they may even run you away from your house in shame of you. But you're going to have another family that I'm going to give you. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, the world may reject you, but you're going to be a part of my long-term bigger family. And let me tell you that Majid and Fadila and Mofida and Salim and all of the other guys that I know of, they know that there is a family where they are completely accepted in Christ in a way that their, their own earthly family would never accept them. And that's one of the reasons that Marcy and I, quite honestly, I mean, I, now at Sheridan Hills, things are, I mean, we, we really, really are enjoying the community of faith here. I mean, Ben just preached about it um, Sunday morning, this beautiful thing that God has just done at Sheridan Hills, certainly over the last 50 something years. But, you know, the longer Marcy and I are back home, the more we experience a genuine love for one another. And it's, it's a sweet thing. It's a good thing. And when we experience that, we, I can tell you, when we first moved back here to the United States, after having that in Europe and in North Africa with people who were really rejected, we missed that. In fact, after the heart attack, we moved to Oklahoma for almost a year, and it was the coldest winter on record up to that point. It was cold, colder in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, uh, the month after we got there than it was on the North Pole. I mean, it was cold that, that time. And I just remember we weren't connected to a family. We weren't connected um, with our own earthly family. We weren't connected with a good church. And uh, we were going to church, but it just, it wasn't like what we had just left, where people had left their homes and left their families in order to, and had brothers and sisters in Christ that accepted them. There was, a, there was a big lacking in our heart on that. But you see, we're starting to see that. Some of you have just thrived on that because your family does not accept you and they do not accept the Lord. But when you come here, you find a, a community of faith that is certainly powerful. That's part of what Jesus is talking about in Mark chapter 10. Look at the next part here. Have those who have claimed the benefits paid the price? So there's many who will claim the benefits of Christianity, but... Have they paid the price? Look at Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquity and heals all your diseases. See, that, that's a great thing to claim. Except that when you start to overlay that with the gospel of what Jesus has been saying, you, we start to see that Psalm 103 is talking about a much bigger, longer view. It's not talking about necessarily the here and the now at this present moment. I mean, how many people, look at Psalm 103, and then you think about the things that Jesus said was going to happen, and you think about what happened with the Apostle Paul and Peter and the other disciples, and how many of them are saying, I claim the beatings of Christ. I claim the persecutions that Jesus promised. You don't hear anybody saying that. Now, I, I, I think anybody who thinks that way, there's something a little wrong with them, I'm not, I'm not running to the next beating, not running to the next persecution. 
But in the same regard, we start to see that there's a much grander gospel than the things that are in this earthly life. Look at the next one here. Is this general praise or a guaranteed promise? We need to ask that question. Is this a general praise or a guaranteed promise? And what we start to see is that it is a general praise of God that there is difficulty and there is hardship that God is going to work through and that he is going to use um, and still cause us to have faith and praise and promise in him, not in our circumstances. Now, I want us to read James chapter 5, and it's at the bottom of page 87. So if you turn it over, you need to go back to the bottom of page 87. And I want you to see a little bit of this. And um, Ivan, can I put you on the spot a little bit and you read up to um, uh, the middle of that paragraph where it says, let him pray. Um, excuse me. Um, end with, let the elders of the church pray for him. Okay? So go ahead and read, if you would, at bottom page 87. Everybody follow along with Ivan. And then he says, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now, this is another passage that very often when you start to, when you start to look at that, there's all kinds of things that you can pull out of that and assume God wants everyone if, you, if you're not looking at the whole counsel of Scripture, God wants everyone to constantly be healed and healthy and wealthy. That, that if they lack anything, that they can come and that they can pray about it and have someone come and pray for them, whether it's financial things or whether it's help, and it immediately be given unto us. But what, we, what we've also recognized is our church has studied the book of James. We have said that James is like the wisdom literature of the New Testament. James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so as we read that, we see that James is saying, look, there's a whole mindset that you need to have. What James was saying to the churches all around the Mediterranean was, hey, you guys are either infusing Judaism onto Christ or you're going with the ways of the world. And J James is saying both of those things has got to go. We studied this in the book of James when we looked at it. We started to see that James was saying, you're claiming all of these earthly things that are so important to you, and James is saying, you need to look to God. You need to trust in God. You need to, you need to come away from the worldliness of the world. You need to come out of the mindset of the world and enter into the mindset of God. Um, as a, when a poor man comes in and you don't esteem him, but a rich man comes in and you think he's great, James is saying, how dare you have this mentality? This is not the mentality of God. True faith of God is a different mentality. So we saw all of those different aspects of James where he's dealing with that. And here we see that we are to pray for one another, that we are to lift up one another, that we are to anoint one another with oil and asking that God would come and bring a healing. We should certainly do that. But we are to also recognize that this is a general picture of God's great healing power over our lives. Does faith guarantee prosperity? All, James is all about patience, 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 endurance, be steadfast. What all of that communicates is your life is hard and your faith in God is hard in a fallen world. He is communicating to the early church, you got to be patient, you got to hold on, you got to trust in the Lord, you have to endure hardship. And so we don't see that there's this automatic quid pro quo of faith and immediate all of these earthly ease and comfort. You see, faith, we, we would say this and underline this, faith is patient. It is patient in suffering. That's what James is really all about. 
It's not about necessarily being completely delivered from all of your suffering. It's that if you read the whole thing, it's talking about patience in that. In fact, like the farmer, underline the word farmer, or circle the word farmer. There's there's three examples here, farmer, prophet, and and Job. Remember this. The idea of the farmer is the farmer, he's going to come and he's going to sow and he's going to water and he's going to pray. He can't water the crop as much as it needs. Um, but he, he's going to do the best he can, and he's going to pray, and he's got to be really patient. He's got to wait for the crop to grow. And sometimes there's drought, and it's going to wipe that thing out. And sometimes there's, there's too much rain, and it causes the seed to rot, and it can't even germinate. Or if it does, the roots will eventually rot if there's too much rain. So he's sitting there, and he's having to be very patient. A farmer has to wait, and he has to be patient, and he has to cultivate. And that's the idea that you see in the book of James, that he's saying, hey, church, you have to be patient. You have to cultivate and trust in the Lord in this. You see, here's the idea, and this is not on your notes, but just kind of think about this. Trust in God with what you cannot control. We are called to, we got to look to God. I can't control the weather. I can't control whether the locusts are going to come or whether it's going to get nematodes or it's going to get something else that's going to ruin the crop. I can't, but I have to trust in God on the things I can't control. But the things I can control, I have to be obedient. So I'm going to trust in God in the things I can't control, and I'm going to be obedient in the things that I can control. So that's, that's the picture of what we see with the farmer. What about the prophet speaking truth? That you want to be a true prophet, not a false prophet. And that's part of what we see here. There were false prophets coming into the church. And they would take and distort the words and turn it. But we're called to be speaking truth, not falsehood. What about Job? Fill it in. Hoping in God's promise. You see, the book of Job is a real problem for prosperity theology. If you really study the book of Job... And you go into the life of Job. The first chapter knocks the chalks out, for one thing. But there is this picture in the book of Job that is just glorious in showing us the long-range plan of God, of hoping in God's purposes. Because God has purposes in all that he is doing. So not only is faith patient in suffering, but faith is prayerful in sorrow. Double underline the word prayerful. It is prayerful in sorrow. So when you're going through sorrow, and when you're going through trouble, and right out to the side, um, verses 13 through 18, because that's really what you see in the last half of this, that what James wants us to see, listen to this, What James wants us to see is that when you're sick and when you're being persecuted and when it's really hard, early church, you be prayerful and you be hopeful in God. Don't don't go into fatalism. Don't go into despair. Don't go into fear. What he's saying is you be prayerful. And so go back up there in the middle of that paragraph. It says, let him call the elders of the church and see the middle of the paragraph at the top. Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, here's part of the idea. Maybe that person can't come. Maybe he's so sick. He's on his deathbed in Macedonia or he's on his deathbed in what is Egypt or or Tunisia or Algeria in the early church. That's that's who this is written to. And he can't come into the church. So he's saying, oh, please come and pray for me and and come and pray that that God would come and, and take care of of my soul and take care if it would be his will for, for me to live. And so the idea is, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We do that here sometimes. If people in the church call and ask us by faith to do that, we're glad to go and to pray over people in the life of our church. Look at the next part here. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. Now, the picture is we know that not everybody that is prayed for is going to be healed. We see that in Scripture. The Apostle Paul himself prayed for deliverance from his own illness, from something that was very serious in his flesh. And he asked the Lord three times. The idea of three times is this idea of Hebrew completion, a complete request coming before God. And God said, you know what, Paul, this is for your own good. And, and you're, you're going to learn to trust me in this. And he said, I've learned that this is so that I would not exalt myself. 
Notice the next part this year. You pray when you are hurting. You pray when you are happy. You pray with the elders. You pray with the church. You confess your sins one, one to another. You see, sin directly causes some sicknesses. There's no doubt about that. But we also see that sin indirectly causes all sickness. Here's the picture. We would not be sick if we were not in a fallen, sinful world. But God in his grace did not wipe us out. But instead, as the world continues, and as we live in this world, God is saving his people. God is showing his goodness. God is showing his grace. Every day that we go on, and people are being saved, and we are glorifying God in our hardship and in our trouble, that we are honoring Christ. Notice this, we are to intercede on behalf of one another. These are the things that James is really emphasizing. That we are to pray for one another, care for one another, meet together. And notice this, the secret to power and effectiveness in prayer is this. Make your wants God's wants. If you want what God wants, then ask for whatever you want. That's what we see the book of James is really about. That you come so in line with what God is saying that you ask him. And, and you, you ask him for the things that he wants. And what, what begins to happen is when we start to see that God's glory is the greatest thing to our heart. That God's glory is the greatest concern that we would have. We can start to see that we begin to say as long as he is glorified, as long as he is exalted... He can do whatever he wants. Now, there's, I understand that there's things that really burden us, and there's things that really hurt, and there's things that are really trouble. But what we begin to see is even through these hardships that God is helping our, our desires to be his desires. You see, here's the thing. Fill this in. The prosperity gospel ignores clear counterexamples in the Bible. The prosperity gospel ignores Anything that goes against these ideas of name it and claim it, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and, and happy in all of these things. Now, what are some of the key examples that we would see in this? Number one, the life and teachings of Jesus. Jesus clearly teaches that as Christians, we are going to experience poverty. We are going to experience hardship. Look what it says here. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you want to go. And Jesus' immediate response is, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury the dead. But as you go, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. Let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The picture is, is that, that there's going to be poverty and there is going to be an abandonment of the things that this world holds on to, including sometimes even the high value of family. It's not saying that you're going to ignore and dishonor your parents, but Jesus is saying that there is a much higher value of my kingdom and my glory as opposed to all of the things that are around you. Look at Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. I mean, when he said that to the rich young ruler, what happened? The rich young ruler went away. He's, he said, go, you, you want to follow me? Sell everything you have and come follow me. And the man turned around and went away, a brokenhearted man. Why? Because he loved the things of this world more than he loved God. The true gospel says you cannot love everything in the world and love me. That's what Jesus is saying through this. Jesus is saying hard words of saying, not even your family, I am, I am not to be rivaled by anything in your life. That's the point. And so if, you, if you're just bent on having comfort, if you're just bent on having finally a retirement of ease, if you're, just, if you're saying, I've got to have this, or I've, I've got to drive this, or I've got to live in this, or I've got to, I've got to have this in my bank, whatever. If you're, if you're bent on those things, Jesus is saying, you cannot be my disciple. You love these other things more than you love me. 
That's the big picture of what prosperity gospel is saying. Now, you know, the problem with prosperity gospel is it's feeding a desire for those things. Crafo Dollar will drive his Rolls Royce into the foyer of the church and get out of his Rolls Royce and walk down the center aisle and go preach. He's, he's, he's exalting this. A local pastor in this county, that's all I'll say, walks through the parking lot where he lives showing the pictures of the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the long Mercedes and everything else. And he's saying, you just got to love it. Just got to love it. This is just, isn't that so cool? You got to love it. I kind of don't think that's what a pastor is supposed to be saying. Saw the video myself. Friends, Jesus, Jesus is fundamentally showing a different picture. Um, notice this. It's not the health wealth gospel. It's more like the homeless and wounded gospel. I mean, that's, that's kind of what Jesus is describing. You, foxes don't have holes and birds don't have nests. Anybody who follows me, he's not going to necessarily have anywhere to lay his head. Jesus is just making the point, you can't be in love with the world and be in love with me. Do you get that? You, we, we need to get that. You, these verses, these passages can be confusing to us if we don't get what... Jesus isn't saying that you're supposed to go, you know, never talk to your father again and let him die without ever hearing from you again. That's not the point. Jesus is making the point of you can't have your love and your heart for me be rivaled by anything else. Notice the next point. God may accomplish his higher purpose in our death than in our life. Right out there to the side, physical safety is not a New Testament value. Physical safety is not a New Testament value. The Apostle Paul never said, oh, you better not go down there. You might get stoned. I'm talking about rocks, not pot. But he's saying, you, you better not, you know, don't do this, don't do that. You know, the, the safety was not there. Now, now he was afraid sometimes because he was tired and he was worn out and he said, these people are picking up rocks again. I better leave. And the Holy Spirit said, don't leave. Nobody's going to stone you. You're going to stay here. I have many people in the city. We see the Lord tell him that at one point. But we do see that the Lord used persecution to spread the church out. I mean, the, the early church, immediately persecution started up and many believers fled Jerusalem and they went out to Judea and Samaria and they even started traveling to other areas of the world. Uh, before, we, before we get too far and think that safety is like a really, safety is such an American value. I mean, we have OSHA, which is good. I mean, OSHA, that, that's not bad. But, I mean, the idea, and there's a lot of good things that come out of safety precautions. I mean, I'm glad that when Cheryl Ann got in an accident, you know, that there were, she had a seatbelt on and the car was made to crush right and all of that worked. She didn't get killed on I-95. I'm very thankful for that. Safety is not a bad thing. But safety is just not a value that you see in the New Testament. We see that God, in fact, may even use someone's death to forward the gospel. We see that over and over and over again. In fact, it was Tertullian, who was a young lawyer in the city of Carthage in the third century, that all of the persecution was coming down on the early church. Persecution, persecution, persecution. And this young lawyer was sitting up there in the Colosseum in Carthage, and he was watching Christians be put to death, and he said, their blood is seed. The more they bleed, the more Christians pop up. Because you see, it causes a culture to start to wonder, why are these people willing to die? Why wouldn't they just say, recantori? Why wouldn't they just recant? Not believing in the Roman gods. Why wouldn't they just do what we're telling them to do and live? And we start to see that that would cause people to say, there must be something here. There's been many, many, many examples of this throughout the last 2,000 years. That Look at that part that we just filled in. God may accomplish higher purposes in our death 
than in our life. There are people who have gone through tremendously painful illnesses and eventually died and suffered well in faith in the Lord and people around them watch that happen and come to believe. So we start to see that it's not only in the teachings of Jesus, but it's also the teachings of Paul. In fact, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. I want you to see this. But we have this treasure in jars of what? Clay. In jars of clay. So we're, we're, we're these fragile things. We're this, we're, we have it on the inside. Who puts treasure in a jar of clay? You don't put your treasure in a jar of clay. I mean, anybody wants the treasure? What do you do? Break that thing. Money goes everywhere. You put treasure in a lockbox, right? You put treasure in a fortified box or you hide it somewhere. But here we see that, that but the Apostle Paul says, we have this treasure in a jar of clay, our earthly bodies, so that to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not us. Now, that's very different than the statements that we read at the beginning from Kenneth Hagin saying that we are made to dominate. No, it's not. The power is not in us. It's in God. Look at the next part. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. He hasn't left us. We may be struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always carrying the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested or shown in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. You see, this is why Tertullian became a Christian in part, is because he saw people willing to die for something. And he was saying, why are they willing to die? In their flesh, they were confessing Christ, even in their death. Look at the end of verse uh, 12, it says, so death is at work in us, but life in you. And so he, part of the example he's saying is, is that some of you have become Christians because of the struggle that we have, and you have wondered why it is that we continue to believe. You see that the surface picture may be a prosperity gospel picture if you just pick and choose little verses, and you can make the Bible say just about anything you want it to say, but if you look at the whole of Scripture, you have to deal with proper theology, biblical theology. Biblical beliefs, and that's what we're seeing here. Look also at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 28. Here again, the Apostle Paul is saying this. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. And what he means by that is, I can't believe I'm about to brag. But he's, he's because the Apostle Paul is saying, this is so ridiculous that I'm going to declare to you all my suffering. Because it's not me, it's him. But he's having to say to them, that look, that there is real reason to believe and there's reason for belief. Look what he says. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. You see, if they did more than 40 lashes, whoever was doing the lashing would be in trouble. So they would do, ah, in case I miscounted, I'm only going to give them 39. That's what that means. So 40 minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers. So he's crossing rivers in the wintertime when you're not supposed to be traveling. Paul would travel even in Macedonia and even in Greece and Rome when you, and during the rainy season and all that. There were times of the year that you wouldn't travel. You normally wouldn't travel during the stormy time in the Mediterranean. He would do that anyway. I mean, he was, he was just saying, safety is not for me. If, I mean, these people have got to hear the gospel. I'm going to cross the river. The river's swollen and raging, and there he is. He's saying, I've got to go. Look at the next part. In danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from what? False brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Now, friends, the prosperity gospel just doesn't like to hang out with these realities. 
But this is the reality of what Jesus was working through in the Apostle Paul. And we start to see that if, they're not, if Jesus is not going to be spared and the Apostle Paul is not going to be spared, then why am I going to be spared? You see, it's not the prosperity gospel. It's more like the adversity gospel. I mean, it's, it's, it's the hardship gospel. You come to Jesus and everything may go, sm- go south. I mean, it, it's going to get harder. God may accomplish higher purposes in our sickness than in our health. So we already said God may accomplish higher purposes in our death than, um, than in our life. Sometimes he will accomplish a higher purpose in our sickness than in our health. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. Look what it says. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. So the Apostle Paul, he was, God was really using him. He was, I mean, he was preaching the word. There were things that he was declaring to the churches and things that, that, that God was really working through him. And I mean... People knew when he spoke that they were hearing from God. He was an apostle that was greatly being used. And so instead of Paul thinking, man, I'm really something. All these people are listening to me. God said, Paul, not going to let that happen. And so look what he says. A thorn was given me in the flesh. Look at this. A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, he sh- that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. He's saying, I'm going to just declare how, what a fool I am, and how difficult I am, and, and how weak I am, and my, maybe even my, my physical struggles here. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, weaknesses, insults, heart. Let's read these together. I am content with what? Weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. So the idea of calamity is, is something that, I mean, it's just, it, it, maybe it's, you know, you're, you're in, a, in a house and you know, the roof falls in. I mean, it's a calamity. It's this thing that just happened. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Yes, pray for healing. But ask God for his spiritual purposes to be proclaimed. Satan may give it to you, but God will use it. So that we we even see here that Satan and all of his scheming, May, may, but we know that God ri- rules and reigns over all things, including even Satan's work. What the bro- brothers of Joseph meant for evil, God meant for good. Very similar idea. Um, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophius, who was ill at Miletus. What does that mean? He left Trophius, who was ill. Trophius was ill, and Trophius didn't get healed. Apparently, it was God's will. I mean, you can rest assured that Paul prayed for Trophius. I mean, I would, I would certainly think that. But he left him behind, and he, he couldn't go on with him. He was sick. This is a reality. And the idea that God never wants anyone sick is simply not true. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 24. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send, a, send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that what? He was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He was going to miss this guy too. I am more, I, he says, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord, him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He said, you weren't able to come help me, but he was helping me, and he nearly died, and now I'm sending him back to you. What a beautiful picture that we see that God is still working 
through the suffering and through the difficulties. Um, the, the apostle Timothy, or excuse me, Timothy was told at the top of the page there, he had, he had frequent ailment, ailments. Timothy had stomach problems. And he kept drinking probably water that would set him off. And he needed the alcohol in the water to kill some of the stuff that was there, very likely. We don't know exactly what all the issues were there. But the picture was there that Timothy was sickly. He had problems. Look what Randy Alcorn says. Randy Alcorn is a great pastor who has suffered greatly. Um, it's from Oregon. Look what he writes. When Paul was taken into chains... Um, from his filthy Roman dungeon and beheaded at the order of the opulent madman Nero, that's the one who Christian history tells us Nero the emperor killed uh, Paul, two representatives of humanity faced off, one of the best and one of the worst. One lived for prosperity on earth, the other did not. One now lives in prosperity in heaven, the other doesn't. We remember both men for what they truly were, which is why we name our sons Paul and our dogs Nero. <laughs> Kaboom. I mean, man, what a good summary of what God did. That's a great summary of this idea. Nero had it all. He had all that. He was the most powerful man in the world during the, the life of the Apostle Paul. And Nero, apparently, had Paul beheaded. But you know what? You wouldn't want to be Nero today. But you would want to be Paul today. Notice this. This is the picture of what God has called us to. You know what? We're out of time. I was going to keep going, but we're out of time. I want you to start to see that the New Testament picture and the Old Testament picture, and we're going to look at this, how those two are very, very interesting uh, in their relationship to one another next week. But the picture is, is that God's glorious big picture is much grander than any of the best that this world has to offer. As a Christian, you're far richer than Bill Gates. As a Christian, you have more fame than any of the crazy people in Hollywood that the tabloids all run around. I mean, you just, you're, you're richer. You have fame with the one who it matters. Because God is a God who cherishes, cherishes his true children. And he calls us the ones that he absolutely loves so much that he would lay down his own life for us. There's no greater statement of love than a man who would lay down his life for his friend, or a God who would lay down his perfect son that we may live. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Um, I pray that this week you have a good end of the week. Pray that you will be encouraged to embrace the true gospel of Christ. Go home tonight and read John. Go home and read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Go home and let God's Word speak to you through the glory of the Psalms. Um, but don't buy the foolishness of this world. Amen?